This is George Reisman, speaking in early 2004. The following lecture series of mine, Inflation and Price Controls, was delivered in the winter of 1976 in New York City. Later on, when it was sold as cassette tapes by Second Renaissance Books, the series was broken into two separate parts. The major portion, embracing the latter part of Lecture 3, all of Lectures 4 through 8, and most of Lecture 9, became the series The Government Against the Economy, which was also the title of the book I had written based on that lecture material. The remaining portion, embracing Lectures 1 and 2, and much of Lecture 3, and a portion of Lecture 9, became the series Inflation and the Quantity Theory of Money. This division was continued by the Jefferson School when it took over the marketing of my tape series. Now, however, in this new CD version, the original arrangement of the nine lectures has been restored. In following these lectures, it will be helpful to have available the lecture supplement titled Inflation and Price Controls, which is referred to from time to time in the lectures. If you are listening to this series as part of my full program, the supplement can be found on the CD labeled Lecture Supplements. If you did not purchase the full program, the supplement should have been sent to you either on a disk or as an email attachment file. Please print out the supplement. The material in the first two and a half of these lectures can be found in chapters 12 and 19 of my book Capitalism. The material in the remainder of the lectures can be found almost entirely in chapters 6 through 8 of Capitalism. The discussion of natural resources and the environment appears in chapter 3. Each of the lectures appears in two tracks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my lecture series on inflation and price controls. Before I begin the opening lecture, I would like to make a number of acknowledgments. First, to the late Ludwig von Mises, the leading advocate, the leading economic advocate of capitalism. Von Mises was my teacher and mentor, and to him I owe most of what I know about economics. Again and again, in the course of this series, I will be presenting his ideas without being able to stop to give him proper acknowledgement at the time. I hope that this brief statement may serve as a token of the debt I owe him and of the acknowledgements that are due him. Second, I would like to express my debt to Ayn Rand, the leading philosophical advocate of capitalism. Ms. Rand's philosophy of objectivism is my own personal philosophy and its principles in the fields of political philosophy, ethical theory, epistemology, and metaphysics have had a very major influence on my approach to capitalism and economic theory. Consequently, even though this lecture series is on economics, there will be numerous occasions on which I borrow or apply some idea of Ms. Rand's without being able to make a proper acknowledgement at the time. I hope that this statement may make amends for such omissions as well as stand as a token of gratitude. Finally, I would like to make a personal acknowledgement to Edith Packer, whose encouragement and confidence in me have made this lecture series possible. Of course, responsibility for everything I say is entirely my own. Now let us begin. As you know, the subject of this lecture series is inflation and price controls. I am presenting this series because I believe that inflation and price controls will be the leading politico-economic issues of the coming decade. I believe that they will constitute the focal point and the decisive battle in the more than century-old struggle between capitalism and socialism, and wider between the philosophy of individual rights on which our country was founded and the doctrine that man exists to serve the state. The outcome of these struggles 
and therefore the issues of inflation and price controls, are of crucial importance to the lives and well-being of all Americans. In essence, what depends on them is whether we can rebuild a rational, free society and resume the marvelous progress that has characterized our country's past, or fall into a state of oppression and decline that will ultimately place us far below the level even of the present-day Russians below their level because for us there will be no United States of America to come to our rescue. The connection between inflation and price controls and these wider issues is almost universally unrecognized. Despite their importance, inflation and price controls are surrounded by a cloud of incredible ignorance and confusion to the point that it is no exaggeration to say that we are living in an intellectual dark age as far as the public's knowledge of these subjects is concerned. It is this that makes them so potentially dangerous and which makes the dissemination of knowledge about them so necessary and urgent. Let us begin by considering the present state of mind of most people concerning these subjects. Practically everyone nowadays defines inflation as, quote, rising prices. This definition of inflation is a reflection of the ignorance that prevails about the subject, and it spreads further ignorance and outright destruction in its wake. Observe, this definition says absolutely nothing about any specific cause of rising prices. It implies, therefore, that inflation can be caused by anything that raises prices. It is no wonder, then, that having accepted this definition, people are confused about inflation. There is a vast number of things that might raise the price of any given item, all the way from bad weather causing poor crops, and thus higher farm prices, to the development of a fad for some novelty. On the basis of the definition of inflation as rising prices, people are led to consider every possible cause of a higher price anywhere as a possible cause of inflation, and to believe that the cause of inflation can vary from case to case. The effect of believing that inflation can be caused by a huge list of things that the mind has no clear-cut way of organizing or holding is that for all practical purposes, people are led to regard inflation as causeless. Ask the average person what causes inflation, and at most, a blur of confused bits and pieces of knowledge about what might raise, about what might raise prices in this or that case comes to his mind. For practical purposes, he has no idea of the cause. More precisely, I should say he has absolutely no rational or scientific idea of the cause. The definition of inflation as rising prices does imply some notion of cause. It implies, in effect, that inflation is almost a kind of devil's work. That is, it implies that it is the result of the ill will of evil, powerful people above all, of big businessmen driven by the greed for higher profits. This is the most popular explanation of inflation, and there is no way it could not be, given the general acceptance of the definition of inflation as rising prices. For observe further, if inflation is defined as simply being rising prices, then it follows that inflation only comes into existence when businessmen raise their prices and exists only to the extent that they raise their prices. In other words, it follows from the current definition that inflation exists when and to the extent that someone, Jones, the corner grocer, U.S. Steel, or whomever, raises his price. It follows further that inflation would not exist if Jones or whoever did not raise his price. In the absence of any clear-cut understanding of why Jones or whoever must raise his price, there is no way that people can avoid concluding 
that Jones or whoever is responsible for inflation. The real view that most people have of inflation, therefore, is that it is something caused by the evil of private individuals, especially greedy businessmen. This view of the nature of inflation suggests an apparent and seemingly logical remedy. The government, motivated by concern for the public welfare, should forbid the evil businessmen to raise their prices. Price controls, it appears, are the solution to inflation. And just as inflation stands in people's minds as a causeless phenomenon born of mere ill will, so price controls are regarded as having no effects but that of stamping out inflation. In the view of most people, what we have in the matter of inflation and price controls is a causeless evil overpowered by an otherwise effectless good. To put this another way, what most people do in the matter of inflation and price controls is to begin their thinking at the point of the businessman raising his prices and to end it at the point of the government slapping him down with a verbote. All that comes before and all that follows after is a blank in their minds. The purpose of these lectures is to help to begin to fill in these blanks. In them, I am going to do just two things. I am going to explain the cause of rising prices and the effects of price controls. I will summarize for you right now my leading conclusions, my theme. And that is that the sole, the exclusive cause of our rising prices is the government's expansion of the quantity of money and that the effect of price controls is economic chaos and the destruction of production, culminating in a socialist dictatorship. I will show that the attempt to deal with inflation by imposing price controls is similar to an attempt to deal with expanding pressure in a boiler by means of manipulating the needle in the boiler's pressure gauge. It is an attempt to deal with a symptom, not a cause. And like any such manipulation, it deprives men of knowledge they require to take appropriate action. Prices, I will show, are equivalent to an instrument panel on the basis of which everyone plans his economic activities and which enable the plans of each individual to be harmoniously adjusted to the plans of all other individuals. When price controls are imposed, every gauge on this instrument panel is frozen and men are left to run their lives chaotically. They are left in an analogous position to the pilots of a fleet of airplanes flying in close formation who would find their instrument panels frozen. I have divided this course into three parts. Part one deals with the cause of rising prices. It includes the remainder of tonight's lecture, the second and most of the third lecture. Part two of the course explains how a free market, that is, a market without price controls, operates. This part is indispensable to understanding the effects of price controls. It will enable us to see what we lose when we impose controls. This part will occupy the remainder of Lecture 3 and run through the end of Lecture 5. Part 3, which will comprise the rest of the course, will be devoted to an exhaustive analysis of the effects of price controls. It will conclude with an analysis of socialism, which, as I have said, is the culmination of price controls. Now let us turn to the cause of rising prices. This discussion will consist of two basic sections. First, tonight, the positive proof that the government is responsible for rising prices by virtue of its expansion of the money supply. Second, in lectures two and three, a refutation of all alternative explanations of rising prices showing how every such explanation in the last analysis only confirms the thesis that the cause is the government's expansion of the money supply. 
the theory of rising prices that I am out to prove is not original with me. Its origins go back well before the time of Adam Smith, and it has been endorsed by every great economist from Smith to von Mises. The name of this theory is the quantity theory of money. In briefest essence, the quantity theory of money declares that the value of money, like the value of any good, depends on the quantity of it. The larger the quantity of any good, the lower its value. The larger the quantity of money, the lower its value. A lower value of money, of course, means higher prices of goods. According to the quantity theory of money, rising prices are the reflection of a falling value of money resulting from an expanding quantity of money. I will repeat all of this because it is so important. The quantity theory of money declares that the value of money, like the value of any good, depends on the quantity of it. The larger the quantity of any good, the lower its value. The larger the quantity of money, the lower its value. A lower value of money means higher prices of goods. According to the quantity theory of money, rising prices are the reflection of a falling value of money resulting from an expanding quantity of money. Once the truth of the quantity theory of money is established, the government's responsibility for rising prices follows immediately. Under the conditions of the last 60 years or more, the government has had virtually total control over the quantity of money. It has deliberately brought about its rapid increase. The quantity theory of money and also the opposition to it need to be placed in proper perspective. The quantity theory of money shows inflation to be a product of government, not of private citizens. It implies, in fact, that inflation ought to be defined in terms of an increase in the quantity of money. Specifically, as an increase in the quantity of money caused by the government. An increase in the quantity of money caused by the government. And indeed, inflation traditionally was defined in such terms until well into this century when the meaning was switched to rising prices. The quantity theory of money is unpalatable to today's intellectuals. And frankly, they have done everything possible to evade it and deprive it of public influence. The confusion that prevails on the subject of inflation is by no means entirely innocent or accidental. It is largely the result of deliberate evasion and obfuscation by today's intellectuals. Let us try to understand why today's intellectuals are so opposed to the quantity theory of money. Today's intellectuals are overwhelmingly in favor of socialism, or as a minimum of the so-called mixed economy, by which I mean capitalism combined with a large and growing list of socialistically motivated acts of government intervention. The quantity theory of money, on the other hand, is a powerful intellectual bulwark against socialism and poses a major threat even to the continued existence of the mixed economy. <coughs> Observe, if the quantity theory of money is admitted to be correct, and I will prove that it is correct, and if it were to be endorsed by public opinion, then it would be impossible to impose socialism through the back door of price and wage controls. Indeed, in such circumstances, the resort to price and wage controls would be revealed as manifesting either unpardonable hypocrisy on the part of the government or unpardonable ignorance of economics. Because if the quantity theory of money is correct and the government knows it, then the government is morally vicious in seeking to blame and punish others for rising prices that are the result of its own expansion of the money supply. If the quantity theory of money is correct and the government does not know it, but prints money and blames others for the consequences out of sheer ignorance, then it is stupid to the point of being unfit to govern. 
Further, if the quantity theory of money is correct, then it follows that inflation can be stopped very simply. All that is necessary is to deprive the government of the power to expand the quantity of money. This can be achieved by defining the monetary unit as a weight of gold or silver and requiring that for every unit of money there be a corresponding physical unit of gold or silver. In such circumstances, the quantity of money could not increase any more rapidly than the precious metals. Since the supply of precious metals would be very unlikely to increase more rapidly than the general mass of commodities, it follows that it would be virtually impossible for the general level of prices to rise. The quantity theory of money is a threat to the continued existence of the mixed economy because, as we have just seen, it implies the establishment of a gold standard. A gold standard would deprive the government of the power to expand the money supply. If the government lost that power, the effect would be to force the government to operate with a balanced budget. A balanced budget means that all of the government's expenditures are provided for out of equivalent tax revenues. Failure to operate with a balanced budget under a gold standard would confront the government with a mounting debt and eventual bankruptcy. The need to balance the budget would threaten the existence of the mixed economy. It would represent a continuous challenge to the leading premise of the mixed economy, which is that the government has the power to provide, quote, free benefits or at any rate, benefits of far greater value than their cost to the beneficiaries. The requirement of a balanced budget would mean that every time the government proposed some new benefit, it would simultaneously have to propose some new tax. The benefits would cease to appear as free. The entire way that people think of the government would change they would no longer be able to regard the government as having any independent funds of its own, funds which it did not first take from the people. The power to expand the money supply is vital to the mixed economy. It is necessary to create the illusion that the government can provide people with things they do not have to pay for. Of course, even when the government has the power to expand the money supply, it cannot genuinely provide people with free benefits of any kind. All that it can do is create the appearance of the benefits being free. The real cost of the benefits is still there, only it shows up in ways that people do not associate with the benefits. It shows up in higher prices for the things they buy. And those higher prices, of course, they blame on businessmen. Then people ask the same government to assume still wider powers and impose price controls. In short, today's intellectuals cannot tolerate the quantity theory of money because it threatens to blow the whole racket of the mixed economy as well as barring the path to socialism. Public understanding and acceptance of the quantity theory of money thus stand as a critical objective for which every supporter of capitalism and individual rights ought to strive. My objective in the first part of this course is to make you all virtual experts on the quantity theory of money, to the point where you will be able to propound it in public and answer virtually every objection that you may hear raised against it. And now let me begin to prove the quantity theory of money to prove why the government's increase in the quantity of money is the cause of our rising prices. My proof will consist of a series of steps that I have outlined and summarized for you in the handout you received. I will simply name these steps for you now in advance so that you will have some idea of where I am going to take you. We are going to start with the effect, rising prices, and work our way back to the cause, an expanding quantity of money. 
I am going to distill the cause out of the effect, so to speak. We are going to be dealing with increases in the general level of consumer prices, the consumer price level, as it is popularly called. When people speak of inflation, what they have in mind is not an isolated rise in some prices here and there, offset by a fall in prices elsewhere, but a rise in the generality of prices. The consumer price level is a weighted average of all consumer prices. First, I am going to show that the general level of consumer prices is equal to the aggregate demand for consumers' goods divided by the aggregate supply of consumers' goods. This is point one in the outline, the formula. By the way, from now on, in the context of discussing inflation, whenever I use the terms supply and demand, I will be referring to aggregate supply and aggregate demand, unless I indicate otherwise. Second, point two in the outline, I will show that there are only two conceivable ways in which the consumer price level can rise. Namely, either the demand for consumer goods must rise or the supply of consumer goods must fall. Third, and this relates to points three and four in the outline, I will show why supply reductions must be ruled out as a cause of a rising price level leaving rising demand as the only possible explanation. Finally, and this is described under points five, six, and seven, I will show how a rising demand on a scale great enough to raise prices is the result of an expanding quantity of money caused by the government. So what I'll be doing is showing that the price level equals demand divided by supply and can only rise if there is more demand or less supply. And then I'll show why we have to eliminate less supply, leaving us with more demand as the only possible cause of rising prices. And finally, I'll show how more demand on a scale great enough to raise prices is the result of the government's increase in the money supply. As step one, Consider the fact that the general consumer price level reflects the exchange of some definite overall quantity of consumer goods against some definite overall expenditure of money for those consumer goods. In any given year, some definite mass of houses, cars, soap, matches, and everything else in between exchanges against some definite overall expenditure of money the mass of consumers' goods goes up against the total expenditure of money to buy them, and the result, the arithmetical quotient, is the general consumer price level. Now, the expenditure of money is a manifestation of demand, by which I mean the willingness combined with the ability to spend money. The quantity of goods sold is a manifestation of supply, by which I mean the existence of goods combined with a willingness to sell them. It follows from this discussion that the determination of the consumer price level can be described in terms of the simple formula which you have before you. That formula shows that the general level of consumer prices equals the demand for consumer goods as manifested in a definite total expenditure of money to buy them divided by the supply of consumer goods, as manifested in a definite total quantity of consumer goods sold. The formula reads P equals D over S, where P is the general level of consumer prices, D is the aggregate demand for consumer goods, as manifested in a definite total expenditure of money to buy consumer goods, and S is the aggregate supply of consumer goods as manifested in a definite total quantity of consumer goods sold. This formula shows that the general price level is merely the arithmetical quotient of a numerator divided by a denominator. Demand is the numerator and supply is the denominator. I will repeat this because it is important that you learn to think of the price level in these terms. 
the general consumer price level is merely the arithmetical quotient of a numerator divided by a denominator. Demand is the numerator and supply is the denominator. Let us use some concrete numbers in our formula to make it more real. Suppose we have a very small, isolated economic system somewhere in which the total spending for consumer goods during the year is a mere $10,000. Let us represent the total quantity of consumer goods sold in that economy as 1,000 units. The general price level, therefore, must be $10 per unit in that economy, reflecting the division of $10,000 of demand by 1,000 units of supply. Obviously, nothing fundamental is changed if we substitute for the $10,000 and 1,000 units of our imaginary small economy the more than trillion dollars of consumer demand and the vast supply of our own economy. Still, the general price level equals the division of the demand by the supply. Now, please hold in mind the fact that the price level is always an arithmetical quotient with demand as the numerator and supply as the denominator, because this leads us to the second step in our proof of the quantity theory of money, point two in the outline. Namely, that there are only two conceivable ways that the general price level can rise. Either demand must rise or supply must fall. No third way is conceivable. Try to imagine a quotient that rises without the numerator rising or the denominator falling. It is a mathematical impossibility. Now, at this point, some of you might be wondering about what has happened to all of the other alleged causes of inflation that you may have heard of, such as the demands of labor unions, higher taxes, bad growing weather, what have you. Actually, I have not yet excluded any of them. What I have shown is that more demand or less supply are the only conceivable proximate or direct causes of a higher price level. This does not yet rule out the possibility of all manner of other immediate or indirect causes of higher prices. However, it does impose a critical test on any such alleged cause. And that is that any cause of higher prices other than more demand or less supply must operate through its effect in producing more demand or less supply. If there is something which is alleged to be a cause of higher prices other than more demand or less supply themselves, and we cannot show how it raises demand or reduces supply, then we must dismiss it out of hand. More demand or less supply are the necessary, indispensable connection between higher prices and any alleged immediate cause of higher prices. If they are absent, there simply is no connection. And now we're ready to consider the third step in our demonstration of the quantity theory of money, namely, that reductions in supply can be eliminated from consideration as the cause of a rising price level, either in the United States or elsewhere. There are seven reasons for eliminating reductions in supply, and I have listed them A through G in the outline. A, the fact is that in almost every year that prices have risen in the United States, supply has actually increased rather than decreased. Think how much production and supply have increased since World War II, for example. Supply has increased enormously as the result of a larger population and consequently more people working, and even more as the result of technological progress and capital accumulation, enabling each worker to produce a greater output. The same has been true in Western Europe and Japan in this period. Our formula for the general price level shows that the effect of increases in supply must be to reduce prices. As an example, think back to our imaginary economy, which had $10,000 of demand and 1,000 units of supply. If it continued to have the same demand, but a larger supply, say 2,000 units, its price level would fall. 
it would fall from $10 a unit to $5 a unit. The fact that the American price level has risen, therefore, despite vast increases in supply, can only be ascribed to the influence of an even more powerful increase in demand. The problem of rising prices in the United States is clearly one of rising demand, not falling supply. Of course, there are some countries in which supply has fallen, and fallen quite substantially in recent years. Chile and Uruguay are leading examples. While I do not know the precise extent of the fall in supply in these countries, a figure of 50% does not seem unreasonable as a cumulative total for the last decade. If we take the figure of 50%, we could account for a doubling of the price level in these countries on the basis of supply reductions. I say a doubling because our formula for the general price level shows that a halving of supply with an unchanged demand must produce a doubling. Again, as a concrete example of the effects of a halving of supply, think back to our hypothetical economy and imagine that supply fell from 1,000 units to 500 units. 500 units divided into $10,000 of demand would mean a price level of $20 per unit instead of the initial $10 per unit. However, as is well known, the price levels in countries like Chile and Uruguay have not increased by a factor of two over this period, but by more like a factor of 50 or 100. Therefore, even where supply has decreased, the overwhelmingly greater part of the rise in prices cannot be accounted for on the basis of reductions in supply, but must be ascribed to increases in demand. This is point B. This brings me to point C, which is that reductions in supply could only explain a sustained significant rise in prices if material civilization were in the process of speedily disappearing, which of course it isn't. Observe, the price level formula implies that a doubling of prices caused by a decrease in supply requires an actual halving of supply. To return once again to our hypothetical small economy, if the demand were to remain stable at $10,000, and yet the price level were to rise from $10 a unit to $20 a unit, it would be mathematically necessary that supply fell from 1,000 units to 500 units. There is an important principle here, and that is, that every rise in the price level ascribable to a decrease in supply implies a decrease that is inversely proportionate. For example, as we just saw, if a doubling of the price level is to be ascribed to a fall in supply, it follows that supply must have halved over the same interval of time. A tripling of prices ascribable to a fall in supply implies a reduction of supply to one-third of its initial level, and so on. If a sustained rate of increase in the price level, such as 5%, 10%, or 100% a year, is to be ascribed to supply reductions, it follows that in each year, supply would have to fall in inverse proportion to the rise in prices. It is obvious, therefore, that if any sustained even moderately significant rate of increase in the price level were to be ascribable to supply reductions, a virtual disappearance of material civilization would be implied within a fairly short period of time. For example, in the course of a single generation, a 5% annual rise in prices based on supply reductions would imply a cumulative reduction in supply to about one-third of its initial level because at that rate, prices would approximately triple in a generation. A 10% annual rise in prices based on supply reductions and sustained for a generation would imply a reduction in supply to about one-eighth of its initial level, and so on. Furthermore, and this brings us to point D, 
If we look at countries like Chile and Uruguay that have actually experienced significant supply reductions, it becomes obvious that much or even all of the reductions in supply that have occurred there are themselves the result of the rapid increases in demand that have taken place in those countries. A rapidly rising aggregate demand disrupts production. In the case of Chile and Uruguay, the rapid rise in prices it has brought about has caused widespread discontent and fomented crippling strikes and sabotage. In these ways and others, a rapidly rising aggregate demand acts to reduce production and therefore supply. And this is point D, namely a decrease in supply often is itself merely an indirect consequence of a rapidly rising aggregate demand rather than being an initiating cause of rising prices. Let us look further at supply reductions, at such supply reductions as are not themselves caused by rising demand and which therefore may truly be said to be an independent cause of higher prices. For example, poor crops due to bad weather. Even such supply reductions should not be described as a cause of inflation, despite the fact that they raise the general price level in the years in which they occur. The reason is that they do not produce two major symptoms of inflation. First, point E, they do not produce the range of price increases that people associate with inflation. And second, point F, they do not produce the effects on the relations between debtors and creditors that people associate with inflation. Let us consider each of these points in turn. Observe, when people complain of inflation, they have in mind more than a mere rise in the weighted average of consumer prices that is depicted in the consumer price level formula. They have in mind a condition in which almost every individual price rises and hardly any individual prices fall. It is highly doubtful that they would complain of inflation if a large number of individual prices actually fell even if, at the same time, the consumer price level, in the sense of the weighted average of consumer prices, rose. Yet precisely this would be the effect of reductions in supply that were not accompanied by increases in demand. If supply fell without being accompanied by increases in demand, the effect would be that a whole host of prices would actually fall even though the weighted average of prices rose. A large number of prices would fall because the effect of a reduction in supply would be to impoverish people. As they became impoverished, they would concentrate a larger and larger proportion of their limited aggregate demand on necessities and a smaller and smaller proportion on luxuries. The prices of all luxury and semi-luxury items, therefore, would tend to fall. To understand this result, consider the well-known fact that decreases in the supply of necessities produce more than proportionate increases in their prices. A 5% reduction in the supply of wheat, for example, might raise its price by 25% or more. This kind of situation implies a shifting of demand away from comparative luxury goods and to wheat or to any other necessity or comparative necessity in decreased supply. People have the money to pay the disproportionately higher prices of necessities in reduced supply only by taking money away from luxuries and that acts to reduce the price of luxuries. The principle here is that a drop in the supply of any good that, comparatively speaking, is a necessity causes demand to shift to it from goods that, comparatively speaking, are luxuries. Its price rises more than in proportion to the drop in supply, and their prices actually tend to fall. Similarly, if the supply of any good falls that is employed with other 
complementary goods, its price tends to rise disproportionately while their prices actually tend to fall. For example, a drop in the supply of gasoline causes a sharp jump in the price of gasoline and at the same time acts to reduce the demand for automobiles, motel rooms, and so on. The prices of such things, therefore, tend to fall and actually would fall if the quantity of money and demand in the aggregate did not rise and thus hold up or even increase the demand for them. On the basis of this discussion, I believe it should be clear that if not accompanied by increasing aggregate demand, falling supply would be accompanied by widespread declines in prices, even while the weighted average of prices rose. It would therefore not qualify as a cause of what most people have in mind when they complain of inflation. In order for practically every price to rise, there must be rising aggregate demand. That is the only way that the demand for some goods can jump without reducing the demand for other goods. Now let us consider the second symptom that supply reductions acting alone cannot produce, namely the effect on the relations between debtors and creditors that is associated with inflation. Point F. One of the major symptoms associated with inflation is that debtors gain at the expense of creditors. The creditors receive a contractually fixed rate of interest and are entitled to repayment only of a contractually fixed principal. In a period of inflation, the debtors meet these contractual obligations in money of less value than they borrowed and enjoy a gain at the expense of their creditors. Now, the phenomenon of debtors gaining at the expense of creditors cannot occur if the rise in prices results from a decrease in the supply of goods. It can only occur if the rise in prices results from an increase in demand and the quantity of money. If all that happens is a fall in supply, then it is certainly true that prices rise and creditors suffer because their contractually fixed money incomes and assets buy less. But in that case, debtors suffer equally, if not more, than creditors. If prices rise because of falling supply, the money incomes and the money value of the assets of debtors do not rise on the average any more than those of creditors. The debtors in this case have no greater sources of money coming in than before, and they too suffer the effects of higher prices, which may even absorb their means of paying debts. Consider the case of the average business firm that borrows money. If demand does not rise, the average business firm will not have greater sales revenues. As a result, it will not have any greater source of money to pay debts. It may well have less money available to pay debts if more of those sales revenues are tied up in meeting operating costs. In the same way, the average consumer who borrows money, say to finance a home, will not find either his money income or the money value of his property any greater if the rise in prices is due merely to a decrease in supply. In such a case, he may well find them less, because as we have seen, such a rise in prices is accompanied by a shift of demand away from comparative luxury goods to comparative necessities, and away from some complementary goods to others. Many consumer borrowers, therefore, namely those employed in producing the comparative luxury goods or the complementary goods in reduced demand, will be unemployed or earning lower wages. And the value of many homes will actually fall as the demand for them drops. In addition, the higher cost of living makes debt repayment more difficult out of any given money income. Hence, in order to account for the phenomenon of debtors gaining at the expense of creditors, 
the rise in prices must originate on the side of demand and money, not supply. There must be more aggregate demand due to the expansion of the money supply. This alone is what raises the sales revenues, money incomes, and property values of borrowers as a class, and thus makes debt repayment easier for them. Finally, point G, there is one more reason for excluding higher prices caused by less supply from the category of inflation. And that is that if they are described as inflation, it implies the absurdity that more supply, more wealth, is the cause of depressions and poverty. Because if higher prices due to less supply are inflation, then it follows that lower prices due to more supply are deflation. But deflation means a depression, which is a state of poverty. Thus, if we say that higher prices due to less supply are inflation, we imply that more supply causes deflation, depression, poverty. This is a self-contradiction because more supply means more goods, which of course mean greater prosperity. The truth is that inflation and deflation are concepts that do not pertain to changes in the price level per se, but only to changes in the price level that originate on the side of money and demand. We have now eliminated reductions in supply as a cause of inflation. We have eliminated them, first of all, as a significant factor in raising prices. And to the extent we have not totally eliminated them as a factor in raising prices, we have showed that such price increases as they do cause cannot properly be described as inflation. They cannot because they contradict important symptoms of inflation and because to describe them as inflation implies the absurdity that more supply is the cause of poverty. This means we have narrowed the problem of inflation down exclusively to one of rising aggregate demand, which our formula for the general price level shows to be the only conceivable alternative. This is point four in the outline. And this brings us to the final step in this phase of our discussion. And that is that an increase in demand on a scale great enough to raise prices is the result of an increase in the quantity of money caused by the government. This last step is a large one, and to accomplish it, we must break it up into three smaller steps, which appear in the outline as points five, six, and seven. What I am going to do in this phase of our discussion is the following. First, point five, I am going to show how a rise in aggregate demand is the result of an increase in the quantity of money. Second, point six, I am going to show how in the absence of government interference with the quantity of money, the quantity of money would almost never increase rapidly enough to raise demand to the point of outstripping the increase in supply, that is, to the point of raising prices. Finally, point seven, I am going to explain precisely how the government has been responsible for a more rapid rate of increase in the money supply than would be possible under a free economy and is thereby responsible for rising prices. Let us begin. An increase in the quantity of money raises aggregate demand because when new and additional money comes into existence, its owners spend it. Those upon whom it is spent, in turn, respend it. The additional money is spent and respent over and over again so long as it continues in existence. And in this way, it raises the demand for goods that is made in any given year. It is probably easiest to visualize this process in the conditions of a gold standard. 
in which gold coins are money. So imagine that we are back in the Old West and some miners discover gold. They take their gold to the mint and they have it coined. Then they spend the coins in the frontier town. The merchants on whom they spend them turn around and subsequently respend them. And so it goes with the new coins being spent and respent over and over and thus raising the demand of any given year. Now, point six, if the government had not interfered with money in the course of our history, the money that would be used today would be gold and silver. Gold and silver emerged as monies by the free choice of the market and were eliminated only by the action of the government. Paper currency could exist in the form of banknotes issued by private banks, but the paper would be claims to gold or silver on deposit that could be had immediately upon presentation of the notes to the issuer. Checking deposits would exist, and people would buy things and pay bills by check, but the checking deposits, too, would be claims to gold or silver payable on demand. Each banknote and each checking deposit would be a claim to a definite physical quantity of gold or silver. In large measure, this system actually existed in the 19th century. Under such a system, the monetary unit, whatever it may be called, dollar, franc, peso, etc., is in fact a physical weight of precious metal. It is defined as such and is payable according to its definition. It is worth noting that such monetary units as the pound, livre, and lira all began as denoting an actual troy pound of pure silver. The first pennies minted in England contained an actual penny's weight of pure silver on the troy scale. Now, if gold and silver were money, the quantity of money could not be increased any more rapidly than gold and silver could be mined. Indeed, it could not even be increased as rapidly because some significant part of the annual production of these metals is always required for industrial purposes. The annual increase in the supply of gold and silver is always extremely limited because of the great cost of mining these metals. The greatest ingenuity of man has never been able to increase their supply very rapidly for very long. As a result, the use of a gold or silver money can never be accompanied by a sustained rapid rise in prices. Even when the New World was discovered and the accumulated treasure of the Aztecs and Incas was seized by Spain and added to the money supply of Europe, and many new discoveries of gold and silver were made, it took an entire century in most of the countries of Europe for prices to double or triple. In normal circumstances, a gold or silver money tends to be accompanied by constant or even falling prices because the limited increase in demand that larger supplies of gold and silver make possible tends to be offset or more than offset by equal or greater increases in the supply of other goods. In the United States, for example, prices actually fell more or less steadily during the generation preceding the discovery of the California gold fields in 1848 and again in the generation following the Depression of 1873. Of course, and this brings us to point seven, the government has not left money alone. From the very beginning, it has extensively interfered, even in the 19th century. In this century, the government has succeeded in breaking every last connection between the dollar and gold and silver. Today, the dollar is no longer a physical weight of gold or silver. It is any piece of paper that the Federal Reserve System and the Bureau of Engraving decide to stamp as a dollar. The ultimate unit of our money, our monetary standard nowadays, are, e are irredeemable pieces of paper. Such money is called fiat money. It is money by government decree. 
Our fiat money is actually wider than the paper currency. In fact, the paper currency is not the most important part of it. The fiat money also includes, and this is ultimately more important than the paper currency, the deposit liabilities of the Federal Reserve System. The meaning of the expression deposit liabilities will become clear in a moment. The Federal Reserve System acts as the principal banker for the United States Treasury. The Treasury maintains a checking account with the Federal Reserve System. In addition, most of the commercial banks in the country also maintain checking accounts with the Federal Reserve System. These checking accounts of the Treasury and the commercial banks are the deposit liabilities of the Federal Reserve System. They, too, are standard money. They are the full equivalent of currency and are always exchangeable for currency on demand. That is, the Federal Reserve System will always provide currency against the cancellation of its customers' deposits. The sum of the currency of the country plus the deposit liabilities of the Federal Reserve System is often described as the, quote, monetary base. It is the total of the standard money of the country nowadays. Now, we can use the expressions paper money and print money without any harm as a shorthand to describe the whole of the government's money and the process of its creation. But we should remember that much of the government's money is not actually paper and does not come into existence by being printed. Much of it, as I say, is the deposit liabilities of the Federal Reserve System and comes into existence with the stroke of a pen in a credit ledger, as we will soon see. Because of the complexities added by the use of checking deposits, both by the government and by private individuals, it will pay us to consider a further example of money creation along the lines of our gold miner illustration of a few moments ago, but adapted to current conditions. Suppose the Treasury is running short of money. It calls up its banker, the Federal Reserve System, and asks for a loan. The Federal Reserve receives some securities from the Treasury, bonds, Treasury bills, or whichever, and credits the Treasury's checking account with the proceeds of the loan. The Federal Reserve could print currency for the Treasury, and the Treasury could simply spend the currency. But under modern conditions, the Treasury wants to make payments by check, not by cash. So the Federal Reserve credits the Treasury's checking account, and new and additional money has come into existence at the stroke of a pen. Having received a credit to its account, the Treasury can now write additional checks. It sends out, let us assume, a batch of Social Security checks. The recipients of these checks take them to their banks. They can either cash them or deposit them in their own checking accounts. It does not matter which they do. If they cash them, the banks will have to take the checks to the Federal Reserve System and obtain currency for the checks. Then the situation from this point on is literally a matter of the printing of money. The currency the Social Security recipients get, they will spend, and those on whom they spend it will respend it, and so on. New and additional currency will pass from hand to hand, just as in our earlier example, new and additional gold coins passed from hand to hand. But suppose the Social Security recipients deposit the checks in their checking accounts. In this case, they are in a position to write additional checks of their own, and they now spend their Social Security payments in this way instead of spending currency. Those to whom they write the checks in turn deposit the checks in their checking accounts and subsequently write checks of their own. In this case, checking deposits pass from hand to hand in place of currency. In all essentials, the process is identical with the spending of currency. Of course, at any time, the recipient of a check is free to cash it and obtain currency, just as the owner of currency is free to deposit it and write checks. 
The point is that money is created equally by the expansion of the currency or the checking deposit liabilities of the Federal Reserve System. It circulates equally in the form of the passage of currency or the passage of checking balances from hand to hand. Unlike gold and silver, however, the paper money of the government can be created virtually without effort and without cost. The cost of printing a $100 bill, for example, is only a fraction of a cent. The cost of crediting the, che the Treasury's checking account with a billion dollars is not much greater. As a result, there is nothing intrinsic to paper money to limit its quantity. Paper money can be created by the government in any quantity for any purpose. The power to create it constitutes an unlimited power to buy up the people's wealth and depreciate the value of money. Later this evening, we will see to what extent the government has already used this power. Before we can appreciate accurately the extent to which the government has increased the quantity of money, we must understand how the government has encouraged the creation of money by the private commercial banking system. We are going to examine how the government has encouraged the creation of money by the private commercial banking system. I want to preface this discussion by saying that it is somewhat difficult and that it contains some elements that are matters of controversy even among the supporters of the gold standard and capitalism. I believe that the discussion is perfectly understandable, however, and that the material it contains must be understood if one is not to have a badly incomplete knowledge of inflation. I believe that if it is understood, it will enable you to have real insight into the nature of the problems presently confronting our whole financial system. Before I begin, I would like to summarize the major points we have established up to now. And that is simply that inflation is a problem that originates on the side of rising demand, not falling supply. That an expanding quantity of money raises demand, and that the government today has the power to expand the quantity of money without limit. If it is clear to you that in the last analysis, inflation is a problem of governmental expansion of the money supply, then you have learned something very important and we are in business for the rest of the course. But now let us look deeper into the government's creation of money. What we must deal with here is how the government has encouraged the existence of what von Mises calls fiduciary media. Fiduciary media are transferable claims to standard money payable on demand by the issuer and accepted in commerce as the equivalent of standard money, but for which no standard money actually exists. It's not necessary that you write the definition down. The idea will be clear in a moment or two. The larger part of our money supply today consists of fiduciary media in the form of checking deposits. An analysis of the composition of the present United States money supply will make the concept of fiduciary media clearer. The total U.S. money supply is approximately $300 billion. Of this, about $220 billion are in the form of checking deposits held at the commercial banks. Please recall that checking deposits are spendable money and pass from hand to hand in essentially the same way as currency. That is why they are included in the money supply. Now these 220 billion of checking deposits are not standard money. They are a liability, a debt of the various commercial banks. They are a promise of the commercial banks to pay standard money on demand to their depositors. They circulate as the equivalent of standard money so long as no one questions the ability of the banks to meet that promise. Against these 220 billion of checking deposit liabilities, 
the banks hold on the order of $30 billion of standard money as reserves, partly in the form of currency in their actual possession, mainly in the form of deposits with the Federal Reserve System. So we have $220 billion of checking deposits backed by $30 billion of standard money. The difference, $190 billion, represents fiduciary media. Fiduciary media are the portion of checking deposit liabilities of the commercial banks not covered by standard money. Fiduciary media, under present conditions, come into existence in either of two ways. One way is the lending out of standard money that has been deposited in checking accounts. The other way is the creation of new and additional checking deposits without benefit of new and additional standard money. Let us consider an example of each. Imagine an individual deposits $100 of standard money into his checking account. Please note, in doing this, the individual does not part with the use of his money because he can spend the checking deposit itself. His action represents merely a change in the form in which he holds his money. He holds a checking deposit instead of currency. His action is equivalent, in principle, to exchanging a $10 bill for two fives. If the bank now lends out the $100 of standard money he has deposited, or any part of it, it necessarily increases the total quantity of money in circulation, because the depositor still has his $100 that he can spend by writing checks, and the borrower from the bank now has whatever it lends to him. The second way in which fiduciary media are created arises because of the popularity of payment by check. The borrower, in our example, would probably not want currency. He would probably want to make payments by check. As a result, instead of lending him currency, the bank would open a checking account for him and, cre and credit his account with the proceeds of the loan. Observe, here we have a new and additional checking deposit coming into existence without benefit of any additional quantity of standard money on hand. Now, the supporters of fiduciary media are quick to point out that fiduciary media are not without backing of any kind. They are backed, they say, by the loans and investments banks make in creating them and by the capitals of the banks. For example, when a bank creates a checking deposit of $100 for a borrower, the bank's assets also grow by $100, the $100 now owed to the bank by the borrower. And the borrower may have to put up collateral worth more than $100. In addition, the bank has its own capital that is lent out or invested, and this provides further backing, it is argued. As a result of the operation of this principle, the $190 billion of presently outstanding fiduciary media are backed by more than $190 billion of loans and investments made by the banks and by collateral to some additional value as well. And of course, an alternative way of looking at fiduciary media is that of the so-called fractional reserve principle. For example, instead of viewing the present $220 billion of checking deposits as representing $30 billion backed 100% by standard money and $190 billion as backed by no standard money, one can view each dollar of checking deposits as backed by a uniform fraction of standard money, in our case, by 30 220ths of a dollar of standard money. The remaining 190 220ths of each dollar of checking deposits, and more of course, would be viewed as backed by the loans and investments of the banks and the collateral they hold. Whichever way we view them, their supporters argue, and their opponents would agree, fiduciary media are a kind of debt money. They are a debt of the banks, backed by debt, but circulating as money. Now, the great problem of fiduciary media, its opponents charge, and I agree, 
is that they set up money and debt like a house of cards or a row of dominoes that any breeze can knock over. The safety and value of the fiduciary media are supposed to depend on the value of the assets behind them. What is overlooked by the supporters of fiduciary media, however, is that the value of the assets behind them depends on the continued existence of the fiduciary media themselves. To grasp this point clearly, let us assume that there is a failure of a single large bank issuing fiduciary media. Such a failure would result from the failure of some business enterprises to which the bank had made loans. The effect of the bank failure is actually to reduce the quantity of money in the economic system by the amount of the bank's checking deposits. Checking deposits held at a bank that has failed lose the character of money. They cease to be accepted as such in trade. Their status becomes that of an uncertain claim against the bank, a claim that may or may not be paid to some unknown extent at some future time. Now, if the quantity of money actually falls, then the quantity theory of money tells us the demand for goods must fall. But as demand falls, the money revenues of businesses and the money incomes of individuals fall because they are constituted by demand. But as their revenues and incomes fall, the ability of people to pay debts falls, including, of course, their debts to banks. At the same time, the effect of a reduced quantity of money is to reduce the value of assets that banks hold as collateral, such as stock market collateral and the value of the property on which they hold mortgages. It is very easy, therefore, for the failure of one bank issuing fiduciary media to cause the failure of several others, because the wiping out of its fiduciary media endangers the money value of their assets on which their fiduciary media rest. Once started, the process of bank failures wiping out money, the wiping out of money, wiping out the ability to repay debts, the wiping out of the ability to repay debts, wiping out the assets of banks, and this in turn wiping out more money, once started, that process tends to gain momentum. It can, and again and again in our history, has led to periods of major deflation following periods in which the money supply was first inflated in the form of fiduciary media. The last such period of deflation was 1929 to 1933, following the expansionary period of the 20s. The present period has even more massive deflationary potential than 1929 because it follows a much longer, far greater expansion of fiduciary media than occurred in the 1920s. I must say immediately, however, that I do not expect any of the deflationary potential of our day to be realized, because today, unlike 1929, the Federal Reserve System has unlimited power to expand the quantity of standard money. I believe it will do so to whatever extent is necessary to prevent bank failures. This means that the inflation will continue and inevitably accelerate. This is the end of track one. Please go on to track two of lecture one.